Thank you so much, Emily at Notion for hosting us. Um, this is our first time being interviewed. So yes, very exciting. Yeah. Normally we're over there. That's right. Okay. So much to discuss. I know people here are psyched to hear what is Imbue and what are you doing? What are you working on? So let's start with that. What is the problem you're working to solve with Imbue? Yeah. So AI is really exciting. Uh, we started Imbue, formerly called Generally Intelligent, back in 2020. And the idea was, you know, what if we could build AI systems that could help us accomplish larger goals in the world? And we call them agents, which is now a more popular term. And uh, in particular, we're interested in general AI systems, things that can help us accomplish general tasks, not just very specific things. And so where we are today, generative AI is super exciting. We kind of knew this would happen with language models. And we're at a point where language models really understand uh, things about the world and can do, help us do a lot of things. And they're not that good at getting things done uh, on their own. Because you know, if you think about it, like, OK, it's like a person who's read the entire internet but never done anything in the world. <laughs> like, you kind of expect that person to have really weird judgment when it comes to figuring out what to do. And this happens all the time. And especially if you chain a bunch of actions together, like if I want to uh, uh, organize this event, I had to do lots of things. I had to figure out who to invite, invite them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Allie had to do lots of things. Allie had to do lots of things. Um, each step, you know, if each step is stochastic, then we're going to get this compounding error over 150 steps. And so what we do at Imbue is we build AI systems. We train large foundation models optimized for reasoning so that we can be much more reliable on every step. And we, we, we have a particular definition of reasoning. I think it's a pretty you know, general term, which maybe you can talk about. Yeah, tell us what reasoning means to you. Uh, I mean, I think we try to use that word to stay away from the word think or understand, but and to, to use something that's a little bit more specific and also something that is a little bit more evocative of code. Up into the mic a oh, This is, this, okay, well, wow, that's really close. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah, something that's a little more evocative of code as well. So when we think about reasoning, we're thinking about all the things that go into thinking really. Like we're really talking about making general purpose AI systems that are thinking about the world in the same way that we mean it when we say it of a person. Like when I say that you understand something, it means something different than when you say a language model understands something. A language model, we say like understand, but it, it doesn't capture everything that it would capture if a person understood something, right? Like there's, there's a delta there. So that's what we're trying to point out with reasoning for and example, thinking. Yeah, for example, like when I'm working on this event, like sometimes Ali will come to me and ask me a bunch of questions. Like, what kind of person do you want? Do you want this type of person at the dinner? Do you want this type of person? And it changes what she does. And so like, when would a language model know to ask you questions in order to figure out what to do next? When would a language model know this is a risky situation and so therefore I should get additional input from the user? Um, there's also things like planning, playing out a scenario, like playing out hypotheses, figuring out is path A better or is, P, is path B better? Figuring out like, okay, the hypothesis I had is wrong, therefore I should go and like totally change the plan. These are all things that we call reasoning that uh, we would like our systems to be able to do in order for them to actually be useful for us in accomplishing larger goals. Yeah, maybe one more thing is that we also mean reasoning in the sense of like reasonable. Like if Ali is planning this event, she won't accidentally spend a million dollars on the event because that doesn't make any sense. Well, but, <laughs> shouldn't do that uh, and wouldn't, right? That, that's why it's funny. But auto GPT might. Uh, because it doesn't have, it's not reasonable in the same way. It doesn't have the context. This is in my mouth. <laughs> it doesn't have the same context um, about your goals and what makes sense uh, at the end of the day. Yeah, it's really funny. We actually had an agent that spent like $10,000 in a night. And less then, than that. A little bit less than that. And, and then after that, we were like, aha, this is like part of engineering these systems. You know, these systems are not just, it's not just theoretical research that goes into making these models better. There's also a lot of infrastructure work on top of it. Um, we call it spending computer inference time and also adding a bunch of constraints in order to make it so that they're not doing crazy stuff like spending $10,000 in a night. So um, yeah, that's part of what we do. And then on top of the training large foundation models optimized for reasoning, we also build agents that can code uh, and do a bunch of other things. Uh, we focus on code in the beginning because code is actually really useful for reasoning. It turns out that if you train models without code, they're much worse at reasoning, quite interesting. And the idea is that 
my, my intuition is that essentially code is one of the most explicit examples of reasoning data on the internet. It turns out that on the internet, when we're writing things, we don't step-by-step step lay out our reasoning, our reasoning plan in our heads. Um, instead, we're kind of like talking about our conclusions. And so it's actually quite interesting how code allows these models to bootstrap an understanding of how to kind of like think logically. Code is also really useful in that you can imagine an agent that codes writing a process that it will follow as a sort of plan, right? Like if I'm trying to plan an event, the first thing I could do as an agent is like, just take the first action. Like, oh, I guess I'll pick a date. Or I could think like, what is the plan and what is the whole process? And you can imagine laying out that process as a sort of function, maybe not a Python function, maybe a higher level sort of natural language programming type of a thing. Like, oh, first I'm going to decide, you know, the basics, like how much can I spend and what is the goal? And like, and then I'll start to think of like some other sub questions and I'll break this thing down. You can kind of make a plan that's almost an executable function. So the, the, there's a like blended kind of spectrum between code and reasoning where you can output code that is the way that you are reasoning. Yeah, one way to think about AI agents is that they're kind of a natural language programming language. I like it. You mentioned, you quickly alluded to AutoGPT. So I, I wanna talk about that. There are some early agents out there, what we're calling agents. AutoGPT is one of them. Baby AGI is another one. Microsoft Jarvis is another. It sounds like you believe those aren't quite it yet. We're not quite there yet. Why not? And what do you see as the core blocker to them really working? I'll, I'll take that. I think about these agents sort of, it's kind of analogous to like self-driving. If you think about self-driving, maybe over a decade ago, we made a self-driving car that, not me personally, but as a species, <laughs> uh, we made a self-driving car that, you know, made it through like a hundred miles in the desert or something like this. It was very impressive. And people were like, oh, we'll have self-driving cars. But then we didn't have self-driving cars for a very long time. And why is that? Because there's a lot of details that go into actually making self-driving cars that work and to making them work safely and to making them work in various weather conditions and all this other complexity. And so I think right now we're seeing the very beginning versions of these systems that are really promising. And it's really interesting to think about what does an auto GPT that works look like? We will get there, but there's a lot of details that go into the understanding of, you know, exactly how does, how do you even interact with these systems? One thing that we take very seriously internally is this idea of serious context of use, so serious use. This is an idea from Andy Matushik and Michael Nielsen, who worked on tools for thought and interface design. And the core idea is that essentially, if we're just trying to build demos, it's actually really easy to build really cool demos. There are tons of tweet threads that go viral on Twitter. And uh, the problem is, you know, every agent founder I talk to, we'd like to help them. Uh, be able to get to a point where they can deploy their agents. And every agent founder I talk to is like, we will deploy it in two months. We're just two months away for the last nine months. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of the self-driving car problem, which is that there's actually a really long tail of reliability and robustness issues. And there's also, from our experience, uh, kind of trying to get to agents that we can seriously use internally. Part of why we work on code is because we write on a lot of code. And so we build agents for ourselves to write code with. And what we encounter is, okay, we need like lots of tooling in order to make these agents debuggable. We need actually to invent very interesting interfaces in order to be able to like fork these agents, clone them, be able to modify their execution traces, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there are these new kind of design paradigms, design uh, conceptual design ideas that are involved in building agents that are reliable. So really to answer your question, I think a thing that is missing from many of the existing agents is that they're really cool demos of a particular solution or technology and not necessarily focused on the end use case. And so I think it's important for them to be, for us to like make technology that is at the end of the day, trying to do something that a real user really wants to do, like write a test for me and make sure that it runs. Yeah, it turns out like getting our agent to do recruiting scheduling for a long time, uh, like reliably, I, I, it's so hard to get to one that I can trust. <laughs> so you mentioned a lot of factors that go into it. I'm curious, a label, a f I'll mention a few that I think I heard. One is like product, another interface. Uh, then there's the technology, there's the tools, probably the large language models themselves. You know, if you had to rank them or like, what, what do you think would be the main blockers that are like the most important and are uh, blockers that are gonna stop us from getting there that are the most important things to get right first? Yeah, the way we think about it is it's kind of an iterative loop. We build models uh, optimized for reasoning. We use those to build agents that we try to get 
to use ourselves and get to a place where we can reliably use them. What we learn from the agents, we turn into evaluations and also training data for the models. And so that improves the underlying reasoning ability of the models and that the models improve the agents. And then on top of the agents, we work on interfaces and these other things in order to help make the agents debuggable. A lot of the work that we do, we call spending computer inference time. So once the model outputs some text uh, or other things, then uh, do a lot more reasoning you know, at uh, inference time and use that as a way to improve the output of the model. I think it's more of a spectrum also. It's not that you know these things don't work at all. There are Twitter demos of things working great at doing all sorts of complicated stuff. Yeah, like we have a type error, uh, a type error fixer that works pretty well, but it's very trivial. Right, but the difference between agents really working and the demo is that when, it, you know, when you're really using it, does it actually work for your real thing 90% of the time? If it's only working 10% of the time, are you going to keep using that tool? I'm curious, what do you guys think are going to be the first use cases that it does start working for once we get there? I mean, there's a lot of use cases it already works well for. So type error fixing is one example, formatting, fixing. Uh, it can do like copilot style things really well. It doesn't, it's not very good at doing multi-step things on its own just because of compounding errors. Um, but there, we've seen like, yeah, uh, doing code review, doing like a single pass code review on a, on a pull request and then submitting, like creating some comments that I as a human then need to review and resolve. There are a lot of problems where when the human is in the loop, actually, it does a pretty good job. Yeah, I think the place that it starts is with the much shorter types of tasks. So something like instead of just having Copilot, you know, generate a function and that's it, and you have to kind of do all the debugging and looking to, to verify if this is correct, maybe just have it two steps. Like, okay, it writes the function and then it runs the test and tries to fix the test. And then you can kind of build up over that, like not just write the test and run the test, but also maybe think about it. Like, is there anything potentially wrong with this line? Could I improve the thing in a different way? Like maybe I try a bunch of different functions and see which ones work the best. But I think starting with like much smaller uh, tasks and kind of growing from there is gonna be a little bit easier than trying to make this like magical thing that's gonna work at these like super long time horizon tasks. Yeah, that makes sense. This is great because everyone kind of talks about agents, but it's always in very vague terms. So it's really nice to talk to you guys who have thought about this a lot and get more concrete about it. Um, what do you guys think about in terms of timeline, like for your agents or just maybe agents broadly, what are you forecasting? Yeah, I think the biggest blocker to agents working, like being deployed in the world and the timeline being shorter is actually infrastructure that supports people who are building agents, whether that's better reasoning models like what we're building or all of the kind of like operating system type tooling uh, interfaces, et cetera, for debugging agents and also uh, kind of ways for the user to interact with the agents because these are things that are running in the background. So, you know, I deploy an agent, it's running in the background. How do I know it's done a good job? How do I know when it's asking me for input? Um, what if it went wrong 10 steps ago? And now I'm like, ah, damn, it's on like a really weird path. I really want to fix it. These are all open questions that we deal with. And there's actually quite a deep tooling stack needed to get them to work reliably. So I think that's the biggest blocker. Uh, and I don't know, timeline like somewhere in, in the like one year range, we'll certainly see tons of agents doing small things and interacting with the web and et cetera. We already have stuff that does that. And then in the five year range, we'll probably have agents that are doing surprisingly large goals. Yeah, maybe one other blocker is just the amount of compute required to do it. And right now, you know, when you really start testing these things, you're like, oh, okay, I want to see, you know, maybe I have a battery of a thousand functions that I wanted to generate. Okay, and for each one, I want to see like how frequently does it generate this correctly. So let's you do like, you know, a hundred different evaluations for each of these thousand things. Okay, so now you're doing a hundred thousand function evaluations. And that's if you just had like you're just going to prompt an LLM. That's a hundred thousand calls to you know GPT three or whatever. But if you have an agent and now you're going to do ten different calls or a hundred different calls, that gets very expensive very fast, right? So I think compute is also going to be a bottleneck. And how do you make these things more efficient? And how do you make these things a lot faster? Got it. I want to come back to the compute thing in one in one minute because I know you have some interesting takes on that. Um, but before we move past agents here, I think from what I know that. You are working on building agents, but you're working on them kind of internally for this serious use thing that actually the product you're envisioning building is not agents themselves. You're not going to sell agents. 
but rather a platform or in um, uh, to enable others to build agents. Is that right? Yeah, what we expect is that, you know, I mentioned a way to think about AI agents is that they're a natural language programming language. And what we see today is you actually need to do a lot of customization, just like I would have to teach a person in order to, for them to know what my particular workflow is. I need to customize this agent in order for me, uh, it to do exactly what I want it to do. And so for me to get to that point, like I actually need to do quite a bit of work, quite a bit of building myself. What we hope is that one day every person in the world will be able to program in natural language. And we, when, when we say reinventing the personal computer, that's what we mean. One day, you don't need to be a software engineer to program your computer. You can program it in natural language by instructing it to do stuff. Um, and we're not there yet. And so I think we're much less interested in deploying agents for specific verticals and much more interested in the long-term ideal, the vision of enabling every single person to be able to have a computer that is incredibly empowering and can do exactly what they want it to do. I'm really curious. You have a very specific vision that's very different from what other companies are building out there. I'm curious how you came to this vision. I know you've been thinking about it for a long time, and I know you've also been inspired by other movements like Xerox Park. So I would just love to hear how you came to build this vision that you're now building with Imbue. I think a lot of this actually is a combination of the things that Ken June and I are really passionate about. I think one of the things that Kanjun is passionate about, and you can speak to this in a second, is kind of empowering people, right? Like giving people agency is a big thing for our employees, like, and people that we work with is how do we empower people and like allow them to go figure out what is important and what they want to work on, et cetera. Yeah, I talk about how at Imbue, we think about people as creative agents. So at a lot of companies, they're very proud of talking about their employees as assets. And if we think about what an asset is, an asset is something you own, that provides you value that you can discard at any time. <laughs> Brutal. This is a very interesting way to treat humans and to be proud of treating humans. And so I really deeply believe, we really deeply believe that people are creative agents. We're fundamentally creative. We want to see and, and kind of do things in the world. And what we do with our team is empower people to be creative and to kind of be operate in their zone of genius as much as possible. And so, yeah, that's, I think we're obsessed with agency. I'm obsessed with agency. <laughs> and to, to add to it, I love building tools. So I have my own whole suite of weird tools that I've made for myself. And I want to make those, make it possible for other people to do the same kind of thing for other people to say, you know what, I don't like the way that Facebook works. Like, I don't want to see the feed like this. I want to see it like that. Okay, great. It's done. Like, I, instead of it being, oh, this is the way that someone else decided what information I should see or how I should interact with the world, being able to say, no, I want to make it different. And then Make, make that real. Yeah, Josh is the craziest, most productive person I've ever met in my life. And part of it is because he has this crazy custom setup on his computer. So uh, yeah, also can confirm having worked closely with these guys. Um, one thing you've talked about elsewhere is this Xerox Park inspiration. Can you tell us what that is and why that's important to you? Yeah, that was in the, in the Forbes piece. So um, I'm personally very inspired by kind of the advent of the computer and how we got here today. And if we think about it, back in the 1930s, there was the analog computer. Uh, and an analog computer, you couldn't write software. It was like literally a system of, of, of pulleys that, uh, and like gears that like calculated a single function. And then there are a bunch of theoretical breakthroughs, actually, uh, like Turing and Shannon, uh, that led to us being able to develop a digital computer. So von Neumann kind of came up with the architecture of, for the digital computer that we still use today, it has memory, et cetera. And that allowed us to use the computer uh, and to write software programs. That was not a thing with an analog computer. You, you, to reprogram it, you had to like completely reconfigure it. Uh, and being able to write software programs, you have like a single thing that can do multiple things. It's like, okay, that's really powerful. Um, and then in the 1970s, we got to a point where actually the like software uh, not only the computer could be programmed with punch cards, but there was microchips that you could store the programs on. And so now the computer's got a lot smaller and more people could use it. But at that point, still, if you're programming your computer, using your computer, still like a text interface-ish in the best case. And it's quite difficult for a normal person to interact with. And actually at that time, most computers were used by large corporations and the defense industry uh, and not by individual people for this reason. 
And so Xerox Park, what happened was tons of inventions came out of Xerox Park. Uh, the, the ones we know best are like the GUI, the mouse, uh, the idea of Windows and a desktop, uh, the idea of image, like a uh, computer displaying an image to you at all. Uh, and the way that people at Xerox Park got to all of these ideas was actually through serious use, through trying to use their computers to do research for themselves to help make themselves much more effective. Uh, and so we think, you know, we are at the beginning of something that is basically giving free intellectual energy to the world and that there is a way that this could play out that could be, you know, without the GUI, maybe it would have been the, the computer would never have been personal. Maybe it would have been only in the hands of large nations and corporations. And there is a way for this to play out that that could be true. And what we hope to do is to create systems that, again, reinvent the personal computer so that AI can be personal, so that it can enable all of us to be able to, to achieve our own dreams. Um, Josh, I'd love to hear about your vision too and your journey. And I, I have some personal knowledge here, so I'll share that and you can fill in the dots. I know that you've been doing machine learning and NLP research since 2008, since, since college, when neural nets were crap, when they didn't work at all. What got you so excited back then? And how has your excitement and vision for AI changed over the years? Yeah, I think it, it's always appealed to me to have systems that are you know just good tools like i like building my own tools i like building my own software i want these ai systems to be able to help us in a much broader range of things and so the promise of ai you know back in the 90s or 2000 early 2000s even was like oh we'll have this like magical thing this like thinking machine that can do everything it turns out it can't do everything but it can do a lot of really useful things and when i started doing machine learning research actually i was focused on machine translation evaluation which is the problem of if you do automatic machine translation from say Spanish to English, how good is the resulting English sentence, right? And can you do this in an automated way? And, and this was before neural networks were a thing. I mean, we, we could translate from Spanish to English relatively well back then even. And it's just gotten incrementally better every year since then. And you know, back then support vector machines were the cool thing. Then deep learning became the cool thing. And now transformers are cool. I've seen this stuff evolve over a very long time. And I'm less excited about the like, particular technology or like flavor of the year or decade and more uh, the idea that like these are all really good tools for particular things and we're getting to a point where we can make not just like particular you know the old school machine learning where you train this classifier and it's like good at this one thing but we can make these tools that are so much more general like Ken Jun was saying I think that's the part that's always been really inspiring to me is can we get to a place where we can make machines that are actually good at reasoning there's so much more thinking we could do in the world we could think about you know our laws or how to fix all these different problems or how to do biological research or there's a thousand things that are just held back because no one had enough time to think about them. Yeah, uh, it's true. I think like one thing to like, what do we really care about? Software is underwritten in the world and thinking is underdone in the world. Like we don't have enough time and capacity to have a human think about every single problem. It's why systems degrade. It's why uh, things are not as good as we wish they were. But if we had free thinking energy, then we could apply that free thinking energy to basically everything in the world, and then things would be a lot better. That's the hope, at least. <laughs> in practice, there might be a few details in between here and there. So that's the part that we're focused on actually getting right. Thank you both for sharing that. You're both very thoughtful, and you've had really exciting journeys building multiple companies at this point doing research. So I really appreciate you sharing that with us. Okay, we have a whole bunch of topics I want to run through with limited time. So let's go through them quickly. Community. Community has always been really important. For those that don't know, Kenjun and Josh were two of the founders of the Archive, which was a 25 person house in the mission filled with engineers and founders and researchers, actually including the first two authors on GPT-3 at OpenAI, both of which have now gone on to be co-founders at Anthropic. So why has community been important to you, for you as people, but also for Imbue? And I guess you're speaking to a community that you and I have also built together here with Thursday Nights and AI. So what is it that drives you to build this community again and again? Well, I mean, I think ultimately I, I can answer the I question for I you. Don't worry. I can't help it. I feel like it's just the, it's the action I do in the world. That's true. Kendrick is just naturally really good at this. And I think for us, the reason for this is that you spend most of your, I spend most of my time around people that I'm working with or people that I'm living with. And I like spending around people, I like spending time around people that I like. So 
it makes sense to be intentional about finding more people. Yeah, actually, the archive, we found it in 2015. And part of why we founded it is because the military has this study on what causes people to form deep relationships. And it turns out that there are three factors. One is shared experiences. Two is a space that feels safe so that you can let your guard down. And three is actually spontaneous interactions. And one of the few places that all three are satisfied is in college. It's why most of our best friends are made in college and why after a college, even in the, works, in, in the workplace, if it's not psychologically safe, we actually don't make that many new friends as adults. And so we were like, okay, well, why don't we just replicate a college campus and put all of our friends in a house? That sounds fantastic. I think another piece of it that's really interesting is I'm really interested in seniors. So if genius is from your genes, seniors is from your scene. This is a <laughs> quote from our housemate, Jason Ben. I don't take credit <laughs> for it. And so um, I think idea flux is something that we think about a lot at Imbue, kind of what is the air, like what are the ideas in the air? Um, maybe part of why so many interesting things came out of the archive is because the idea flux of our community was really interesting. And then related to that, Let's talk about culture briefly, because you guys alluded to this before. You've been really intentional, and even some could say strange sometimes, in how you build culture and the practices you do as a company. So tell me about those. Uh, well, we have a lot of really weird cultural practices. I think a lot about social process design, and um, Josh and I both. And one of the things we do, so we're doing quarterly planning this week. And one of the things we do is for quarterly planning, every single team member is invited uh, we put some prompts in a document and we do asynchronous synchronous typing. So we're all in a meeting together. We're not talking at all. And all of us are typing in a document, answering these prompts and responding to each other. And it's a 20 person, 25 person conversation in a document. And it's awesome. Like it's so cool. So many good ideas come out because A, we're not waiting for people to talk. B, the loudest person in the room is not the person who's winning. Uh, and there's tons of argument and discussion and clarifying nuance that happens in these documents. It's just so cool. Uh, and so that's an example. We do that for everything. We do that for standup. We do that for all planning meetings. We do that for meetings, all meetings that require decisions, basically as a way to think through situations. Um, that's one example. We also do Feelings Friday. <laughs> yeah, Kenjun has a lot of examples. Since you were chief of staff at Dropbox, I think you did their, you worked on their culture and values there, and you've been very intentional about it at MPU as well. That's true, but I think everything, everything we do has been invented since. So we do Feelings Friday, where we talk about our feelings. We've taught people how to talk about feelings. Um, and Fun Friday, where we hang out as a team every Friday. Let's talk briefly about investing, because uh, that's how we're working together now. So the three of us all invest together through Outset Capital. Um, so you both are investors in addition to founders. And I'm curious what you're excited by, but first, like, why do that? Like, it's pretty clear that you're not like at a loss for things to do. It's not like you just like, oh, I have so much free time. What can I possibly do with all this free time? Like you're very busy people, and yet you are devoting serious time to investing and backing founders and supporting those founders through their journeys. So why do that? I think for me, it's really nice to be engaged with the people who are actually building real things. Like I was talking to someone who is making chips here and we have a founder that we back that's making chips and we have people that are making robots. We have people that are making all sorts of like very interesting new things. And so it's really nice to be able to see all the things that people are thinking of as we're you know in pitch meetings or whatever, or talking to people or brainstorming with, with very early founders. I like being connected to the very specific details because I think in those specific details, in the businesses that people are making and the like problems that they're seeing, that's like the kind of interesting stuff that actually we want to use to kind of help make the product at Imbue. So there's, there's a lot of overlap actually between the two. Yeah, you know, what we do is we're trying to enable entrepreneurs basically to build agents. And if you are building agents, please come talk to us because we have lots of hacks, lots of tools, lots of tricks to get them to actually work more reliably. Um, and so investing, you know, helps us find founders who are doing that and also uh, like just have an ear to the ground on what's going on. It's easy to get lost. Another thing is, I guess, uh, my founder friends call me all the time like, hey, Kanjun, I'm fundraising. Can you review my pitch deck? And I'm giving give them advice. So I was like, oh, you might, might as well just invest as well. <laughs> yes, I think your fundraising chops are well established at this point. <laughs> Um, within investing as investors, what areas or sectors or like, you know, people often within AI say there's like three, three parts to the stack. There's like, you know, the models, there's the infrastructure, and then there's the 
um, the apps on top. So what are you really excited by right now? If you could go tell people in this audience to go build in one area right now, what would be something you'd be excited to have them build in? I think what I'm excited to see is people working, especially early founders, working on much more specific things like make a thing that just does unit tests or just does unit tests for Python 3. 11. Like make it as specific as you possibly can, because there are huge companies like Anthropic and OpenAI and Microsoft and Google that are trying to do these like super general things or more of these infrastructure plays. It's possible that maybe you'll find something like that. But I think that you might actually, it might actually be better to find something like that by starting with something really specific. Like maybe you start making unit testing for Python 3.11 and then you're like, you know what, we can do all Python 3. You know what, we can do not just Python, we can do Haskell too. We can do all languages. Oh, now we're not just writing code. Now we're doing so it can expand from there, but I think it's much more likely to succeed if you're focused on something really, really specific. Yeah, it feels like the moment we're in is historic in a really big way, like much more than in my entire lifetime, bigger than the internet, bigger than the personal computer. And there are like a hundred, maybe a thousand, maybe ten thousand billion dollar companies just lying on the ground right now. No one's doing that stuff. Um, and a lot of the a lot of the moat that we see in founders today is in actually building something that's useful for a customer base and improving it consistently over time to expand to like slightly bigger use cases. So just like with self-driving, instead of picking a problem that is so hard as self-driving, which is like a metal object with humans, both on the inside and on the outside hurtling at 70 miles an hour, don't do that. Um, but there are a lot of smaller problems that can be picked off and then slowly expanded on. <laughs> You guys are both just extremely thoughtful people, extremely thoughtful technologists, extremely thoughtful founders. I'm curious, are there any people or books or things you've done that have really inspired you and shaped you that you might recommend to others? Michael Nielsen. <laughs> Nielsen. It's my housemate, so I'm biased, but um, Michael is one of the most interesting people I've ever met because he's been at the very beginning of a bunch of different movements like 10 years too early, like not too early, 10 years early enough, um, quantum computing, open science, AI, uh, and tools for thought, and kind of the idea of reinventing the computer, you know, comes from him in a lot of ways. And I think he's very active on Twitter, so you can follow him and see his writings there. Josh, what about you? Yeah, that's a good question. I wish I had been more prepared for this part. <laughs> I didn't tell I'll you have I was going to ask that one. <laughs> I'll have to write up something and, and put it online maybe later, but okay. um, there are... I think the thing is, there are so many good books out there. Like there are so many good resources and so many really smart people. And it's so easy to find them online. Josh, Josh reads really fast. Oh, that, that does make it easier. But you can listen to it on an audiobook at 2x speed too. So you don't need to read super fast. You can read a good 20 or 30 books a year. You had this really interesting comment on this recent thesis on power. That's like a specific. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, that's like one really interesting idea of someone on the like policy or regulatory side about the legitimacy of power. We'll, we'll put a thing on our website about it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know right. if I would call out that. More to come. Great. All right, a quick round of applause and we'll go into questions. Thank you guys so much. From Nathan Lyle, Josh, tell us more about the custom tools that make you so productive. Sure. Um, I've written up some blog posts that I've been meaning to post, but I've been lazy. One thing that I made is a thing for tracking my own time. I tracked my own time down to the minute for like the past maybe over a decade now. And that's actually been super helpful for deciding how I want to use my time. So when I look back on it, I can say like, oh, wow, I spent this much time programming, this much time talking to people, this much time at Thursday nights in AI. Is that the amount of time I want to be spending? Yeah. Okay, great. And so I can feel really good about it. That's like one small example. Uh, I have a bunch of, you know, hotkeys and tiny little scripts. To me, the way that I think about it is it's not like there's this one big mega system, but rather it's a like small accretion of things. There's like little automated checklists that like show up inside of my to-do uh, list every once in a while, but it's all just text files. It's just, yeah, prepend some text to this text file on X time in cron, okay. And then another thing takes the text from there and puts it somewhere else. And another one kind of reorganizes it. Another one makes it so I can search over them. There's just all these little things that I've built up over time. And so to me, it's about like making a system that you like and actually use and like continually iterating on and improving it. So once we have agents, hopefully you'll be able to do this much more easily. But I think of it as your like life, your like computing life inf infrastructure. Yeah, another thing I have is a information diet that I have assembled every week, which is basically what, you know, we have diets for food, which is like what food do we put inside of us to be healthy. But I also think about it for information, like what do I want to read? 
right? Do I just want to read random news stories or do I want to see like the particular types of papers that I want to see and the particular types of like surveys that were done or polls or, you know, the top five stories about X topic. Like, yeah. so I have a whole thing that like pulls that together every week as well. Yeah, I think there's a really interesting thing. You have a bunch of Pew reports in your information diet. And so it's like polls of real people on sentiment and, and it causes you to have much more accurate, I think, view of the world. The news at the end of the week as opposed to like while it's happening and where it's like did that actually matter no yeah you've been really inspirational to me in this respect and i think one thing you've said often is just like it's just having a mindset that you build systems so go create a system make it the crappiest possible system like that's the goal don't worry you're actually kind of an anti-perfectionist go make the crappiest thing and then improve over time and that's how you get these really strong durable systems all right next uh from joshua Botch, bach uh, this is a little spicy. Generally intelligent. Yeah, here. Ask yourself. Generally intelligent started out as a company that was interested in building AGI. What happened to that plan? Is this still fitting into the imbue agent um, projects? Or are you leaving it to OpenAI? <laughs> yes. So I think, uh, yes, it's still AGI. But I think the way that we think about what AGI is, we've never... For what it's worth, we've never used the term AGI. Um, we've never said that that's what we're building uh, because we have some issues with the, this idea of artificial general intelligence and what exact, like the way we conceptualize it in popular culture um, is that it is a independent, single kind of human-like system that's able to do all of these different things. And uh, it's a singleton in, in a lot of ways, it's a singleton. And um, it's interesting because conceptually, we actually, uh, in moments of history, have kind of like done this over and over again. So back in the 30s, uh, people were really excited about computers. They were like, this is the first system that can embody purpose, which is what humans are. And so they can be these general systems that embody purpose and let us like embody purpose into the world. Um, and then it happened again with uh, in the 90s with nanobots. People are like, nanobots are these like independent autonomous agents that can do anything. Um, and it turns out that like RNA is a, is a nanobot, but we don't really think about RNA as a nanobot. Um, and it turns out that I, I think, we think the way that it's going to play out, it's kind of like an accretion of um, maybe pieces that have like purpose or have, you know, these other things and that kind of stack on top of each other. And so that's why we like to think about it in terms, I think I finally, I have finally found language to say it as like reinventing the personal computer because what it is, is a next evolution of what our computers are. Um, I think that's, that's what we conceptualize AGI to be. Got it. All right. From yeah, I don't know if I love the, I mean, <laughs> yes. I, don't know if it's a, I don't know if it's a better answer. I mean, I, it's a good question. I don't know if I like the word AGI or even the word agents. Yeah, we hate the, the word, term agent because- Even the word AI, like we use it because it sort of communicates a thing, but really what I wanna be making is a software tooling company. Like what we're trying to make is tools for people and in software, like the fact that it uses AI is actually not the interesting part. So we want, we really want it to be like very human centered. Well, I don't know, a software tooling company that gives free intellectual energy to the world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, agent is actually a terrible term. If anyone has a better term, please tell me because every, again, every new invention of a tool that seems powerful, we use the term agent. We used it with computers. We used it with, uh, with the internet. We were like, oh, uh, the internet is full of software agents that talk to each other. It's like, mm -hmm. um, all right, here's a little fun one from Drumil Patel. I'm sorry. I'm just butchering these names. Um, are you renaming the podcast sad face? Nope, podcast is going to stay the same. Yeah, generally, generally intelligent, this is a story we haven't told before, was initially meant to be the name of the podcast. We actually named the podcast before we started the company. We start, started the podcast first. And so it was never intended to be the name of the company. We were trying to find a better company name, but we failed. And so we have finally successfully found a better company name. Imbue is about imbuing computers with intelligence and imbuing computers with human values. Uh, from Violet Ebex. How did the changing VC landscape influence the fundraising decisions for the company? Can you share any revenue or adoption details that were needed to raise such a massive Series B? What would you qualify as a core inflection point to raise the capital? Core inflection point was a demo. Um, we did not raise from VCs on purpose. Uh, our Series A investor, our Series A lead actually preempted this. 
because the demo was pretty awesome. Um, and we kind of felt like we had line of sight to much better systems for reasoning and also a sense of kind of how we can actually build working agents um, over time. Another question. The recent Sequoia report on AI mentioned that one of their biggest lessons learned was that data sets aren't the moat they thought it would be. Rather, user workflow and user networks are the moats successful AI products are leveraging. Agree or disagree? Agree. Agree. Mm, not super strongly agree. I think you agree with the data moats thing, no? I think data sets are very expensive to procure, um, as in like we pay people to create data sets. Uh, like programming data, it turns out it's not super easy to get. Evaluations, not super easy to get. And so, and like good annotations. Right, but you don't like data moats as a moat. Like I don't if someone believe, says it's data moats, I, I think in, that's what they were saying. Uh, I don't believe in data moats in general. Because data is always replicable. Um, it's like the, the real moat is people won't switch off your product. And that's not about data. Besides reasoning and latency, what is the most unappreciated infrastructural or unsexy bottleneck preventing fluent deployment of genuinely useful agents? Or put another way, why are agents currently so bad in practice when GPT-4, DeepGram, and Eleven Labs are so impressive on their own? I think one, one reason is interface, like the way that you mm. interact with the agent. Right now, you can like, you know, tell an agent to go off and do something in natural language, but then is it succeeding? Is it just wasting thousands of dollars? When is it going to come back? Is it making progress? Like, does it need you to weigh in on it? And if it did come back to you, do you want to like type out your answer? That's kind of obnoxious. So this like, there's a ton of interface questions about how you actually deal with these sort of uncertain systems. Yeah, like one of the things that happened in the beginning was we were like, oh, as a person, I'll just like read what the agent, uh, the reasoning process of the agent, and that'll help me evaluate whether it's doing a good job or not. No, I definitely don't want to read the reasoning process of the agent. It's like five pages of text, so annoying to read. Um, and so there's a really a question we have not solved yet. Um, maybe we've, we've like made really good progress on for really small tools is how do I actually make these systems easy for me to monitor? What needs to be monitored? What doesn't need to be monitored? Um, and so those are all interface questions. I think a second thing is uh, around robustness. So, you know, I mentioned like, these are stochastic systems. So that means they're not going to reliably produce the same output time after time after time. How do you actually get to a point where you can like stack a hundred uh, of these steps together if at every step there's a 10% chance that it's gonna do something totally random that you've never seen before? You need error correction, you need all sorts of other things. What are some of the ways you think about AI safety, similar to Anthropic? while building these tools? Or is it less of a concern? And if so, why? So we think about this in probably two, two well, I mean, at least two primary ways. You can, you can say some, some other uh, three pillars or whatever afterwards. But one, one primary thing is just from a practical perspective, making engineering decisions, like Kanjun was mentioning before, like prevent your agent from spending too much money or taking too long. Like these are things that will be built into products that are actually safety features, right? Like cars have seatbelts because you don't want to go flying through the windshield. Agents need to also have constraints so that they don't spend all the money that you can possibly spend on your credit card. That just makes sense. So those kind of safety things are things that we think about like day to day and are like the understandability and like explainability and, and all of this kind of debugability. Like that's an important part of these systems as well. That's one piece. We call another, that engineering safety. Yeah, so the engineering safety. Very pragmatic. Yeah. And then another piece that we think about also is what kinds of policies and regulations and best practices and principles and things do we want to get in place ahead of time before we've made really super amazing AI agents going out in the world and doing all sorts of things. Like what kinds of things do we need to get right ahead of time? And what kinds of things can we figure out as we go? There's actually an interesting, we recently analyzed the Department of Commerce submissions to their uh, request for comment on AI policy proposals. We used our own agents to analyze it um, as, as an assistant. It was definitely not capable of doing it fully on, on its own. Um, but ha came up with an interesting framework of, okay, how do you actually think about what regulation you need? Because it turns out that there's actually a lot of regulation in place to deal with many of the issues that people talk about. You know, uh, child porn was uh, illegal and it still is. Um, uh, hurting other people in many ways is illegal and it still is. And so these are still illegal things regardless of whether you have an agent or not. But 
Um, there is a two by two we have on our website. There's a blog post if you're interested in, in the policy side where uh, we think about the policy framework in terms of one is kind of like, what's, is it good for the individual? No to yes. And then uh, what is the market incentive? And so if the market incentivizes it and it's good for the individual, it's just gonna happen. We're not that worried about it. If the market disincentivizes it, but it's good for the individual, then we need some carrots. We need the government to give us some carrots so that we can incentivize it. If the market incentivizes it, but it's bad for the individual, then we need a stick because we want to prevent companies from doing this. And if the market disincentivizes it and it's bad for the individual, that is an area where we actually should think pretty seriously about like how do we prevent uh, bad actors from acting in that area. So um, it's nicely breaks down. We're working with a bunch of uh, policymakers to actually write policy here. All right, we're at time, but I'll add in one last question of my own, which is, I know you're hiring very fast. What roles are you hiring for that you're looking for now? And also how do folks here stay engaged and learn more about your journey? I would say we're actually hiring extremely slowly, <laughs> but um, uh, what are the roles? I think uh, maybe two of the three of the four of the most exciting roles right now, hiring a chief of staff, uh, just reopened this uh, job posting. You might have seen it, but we haven't really been hiring it for the last six months. Um, second is a data data engineering. So if you're a data engineer, we have lots of data problems. And a head of data, someone who can actually run the entire process of collecting and cleaning, et cetera, uh, data. And then finally, prototype engineers or prototype slash product engineers, folks who are really interested on the interface side and want to work with us um, to really uh, come up with kind of like new conceptual designs for thinking about these systems. Maybe one last one would be recruiting as well. Uh, yes, we are actively looking for a recruiter. Great. Well, thank you guys so much for coming and chatting and honoring us by being your first joint appearance since announcing your incredible raise. Round of applause for Ken, June, and Josh. Thanks, Ali. <laughs>